how much money and passive income would you say a month that you make? And do you see yourself continuing further into content creating mm-hmm. and moving more into that? At the time of recording this, which is an absurd thing to say, I have like 120,000 followers, which again, it's just like, doesn't even feel like a real number. Like I can't kind of grasp that. So advertisers are now asking like, what are your rates to be able to put this in front of your audience? What's up, fam? Welcome back to Big Picture Podcast, where we discuss faith, testimonies, and perspective while focusing on the big picture. I'm your host, Susan Obi, and this is Big Picture Podcast. I post every other Wednesday. So for today's episode, I am really, really excited. We're going to be talking a little bit about money. So like I mentioned before, a lot of the episodes are just things that I've been thinking through and in my personal life and just also wanting to highlight the story of other people that I feel like will be inspiring and encouraging. So for the past like year or so, I've been thinking a little bit more about what it means to be a good steward of money. I've been thinking about, should I get a financial advisor? What is my savings to spending ratio? And just all those things. So I remember reaching out to a family friend just to talk about it a little bit. And they were like, hey, you should check out Bigger Pockets podcast. I was like, I've never heard of that before. So this is this is kind of my backstory. Then I'll introduce the guests. So I looked up Bigger Pockets podcast, which y'all should look that up if you're interested in, in money and things like that. And I was kind of scrolling through the episodes. There's like a bunch of episodes and one of them caught my eye. So it was this girl who had a savings goal of $10,000. So that resonated with me because I had that same savings goal. I was like, okay, in 2024, I'm going to save $10,000 for this, that, and the third, whatever. And I saw that she was doing that in hundred days. So hundred dollars a day for a hundred days to save $10,000. So I listened to the episode and I was like, okay, I got to get her on the podcast. And here we are today. So Jackie is sitting with me today. So thank you, Jackie, for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah, me too. So how have you been? How are you doing? Great. I've been doing really well. Yeah. Besides the Ohio weather, it's been a little bit dreary over here, but I've been good otherwise. Good, good. Yeah. So I'm just excited to have you on the podcast and just want to hear a little bit more about about your story and thoughts on money. And I'm happy we're going to have this conversation because I was kind of thinking like, who would I have this conversation with? And you popped up on Bigger Pockets and it worked out. So thanks for thanks for coming out. Um, before we get started, I do want to to ask you well first of all tell the people a little bit about about yourself and who you are sure so i'm jackie i'm 26 i live in columbus ohio so just kind of outside of like the main metro area in a suburb of columbus with my husband and our cat actually named obi which was crazy oh my gosh (laughs) that is so true i remember craziest like (laughs) i was like is my cat emailing me right now and i saw email come through I was like oh my gosh when you told me that on the phone like over FaceTime I was like wait what I that know, is so I know. cool well he's named after a Star Wars character so it's a, it's a little less a little less cool that's awesome <laughs> it's not his family name so <laughs> but yeah we live in Columbus Ohio I worked at church full-time during the week and then my husband's an audio engineer we went to Cedarville so that's how I got connected with Ohio and then I got a job in Columbus and I've never left and I've, I've loved it ever since yeah All right. That's awesome. So before we start off, I do want to ask you this question. I just thought of it this morning. Would you like in regards to money, do you see money as something to be kept or something to be given away? Mm, I think that's a that's a complicated question, because I think yes to both in in a certain way. There's something to be said about good stewardship, both in like keeping money that would be wise to either like invest in for future, you know, future proofing your own, you know, well being or the well being of your children, but also to be given away freely, like the early apostles did. So I think there's like a both and kind of situation where like stewarding your money well, isn't just like haphazardly throwing it away. But it is also like not hoarding it for yourself, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good answer. And we're going to get into a little bit of that. But first, I want to go back. So you live in Columbus. Mm -hmm. And recently became an influencer, TikTok <laughs> influencer, all those things. So I just want to hear a little bit more about about your journey. So your goal to save $10,000, $100 a day for $100, $100 a day for 100 days. Yeah. <laughs> 
and a lot of people were really interested. So talk a little bit about about that. Yeah. So the idea came to me because, like you said, like I had a goal of ten thousand dollars by the end of the year in twenty twenty three. My husband and I were finishing saving for a down payment, so we were like, you know, this is like the last little bit that we could use, um, kind of to push into our savings goal. And I'd been kind of doing side hustles, what you'll call like online, like side gigs, on demand jobs, well throughout college, kind of like kind of kept me afloat in college when I didn't have the time to do a real job. I was working at a restaurant up until um, January 2023 in the evenings, and then that restaurant shut down. So I was kind of getting more into like side income through different online venues, just because it was the season of life I was in. I was young, I wanted to save money. Obviously, I was working at a church. So, you know, any extra income helped there. And I thought, you know, I want to set this goal. I think the easiest way to break down a big goal is to look at it by, you know, monthly, weekly, and daily goals. And to me, $100 a day for 100 days seemed somewhat reasonable. Obviously, it was a pretty lofty goal, but it seemed at least somewhat obtainable with the venues I already was using. And so I thought, you know, I'll just post it on TikTok because I've never really posted too much on TikTok. And I thought, you know, I'll just post because it'll keep me accountable. I'm pretty self-motivated and I like to kind of like make things a game with myself. But I thought really if I if I make it a game with myself and I decide I don't want to, you know, continue this goal, I'm the only one who really like disappoints myself. Obviously like this is extra money. It's not something that's like required of me or expected of me. So beyond myself, like I don't have any external motivation. So I thought I'll just post it and I'll post every day. And then that way, if someone's following along, like I know, like I got to post because someone's watching and they know I'm going to post the next day. And that's a- an understatement to say the least of what happened is, you know, for for whatever reason, it resonated with some people. And yeah, just kind of built like a really crazy little following. And yeah, and then I had to continue is what happened. I had to make the $100 a day for 100 days. And that's exactly what what happened. So I completed that in December. And then now I'm on a journey to throw some extra money at our house this year. So that's what I'm doing this year. That's awesome. So two questions come to mind. First, do you feel like the the following and the encouragement on TikTok, the comments and just the having the audience, do you feel like that was helpful in you reaching your goal? Or do you feel like no, I would have probably reached anyways. That's just like the kind of person you are or or what do you think? Yeah, that's definitely, I am pretty self-motivated. People who know me will tell you that. Um, I'm very competitive. So what I've learned is to be competitive with myself and not with other people because, you know, I used to get in trouble a lot when I was a kid. I was so competitive. Like it was hard to play board games with me even because I was just so like aggressively competitive, wanted to win. So it became a, you know, kind of a a fault of mine. And I, in college, kind of realized that like I could harness that for good. Like there are good things about your personality that you can use either steward in a good way or a bad way. And to me, that was my motivation and kind of my like my competitiveness. So I've always tried to make goals of mine a game with myself when I worked at the restaurant um, that I worked at in the evenings. I used to make it like a goal to see how many tips I could earn in a night, like really go the extra mile for customers because I always wanted to beat that like high score I had in my head of like the tips I would bring home. So I think I would probably have completed that goal. I think I want to say yes, but definitely the encouragement helps so much. I mean, whether or not you can do something on your own, isn't it so much more joyful when someone's like encouraging you and breathing life into you? And I was really surprised at how like encouraging people can be online. I think social media sometimes and maybe rightfully so gets a bad rap of, of, you know, being negative. But at least in my little corner of the internet, I think it's been like overwhelmingly positive. And I've found like a really great community of girls, young women who are like helping each other reach their goals. And I think that's what happened there. Yeah, that's amazing. And you definitely obviously reach your goal. So just moved into the new house. So how are you feeling? How are y'all feeling about that? And how is that that going? It's been amazing. We just moved in this past week. So I'm kind of still unboxing, but it was like a surreal process. I mean, like not even when we were quite done with the challenge, when I was done with the challenge, we went into contract. Finding a house was absurdly easy. Definitely a God moment where like it was one of the first houses we looked at. We just knew we had to offer. We didn't even mean to look at a house that soon and we just had for some like crazy reason that was definitely God ordained and it was just like a really easy process and we got into our house and it kind of felt surreal we had friends over the first night we didn't have any furniture like the day we got the keys and we all just had friends over and we ate on the floor and we were like just so like just so overjoyed to even have our own little place so yeah yeah we're in our home now which is just crazy yeah that's that that's like such such a blessing and so I think just kind of transitioning So something that I kind of mentioned in the beginning, so you said that you work for a church, so you identify as a Christian, Christ follower. Something that I've just been kind of thinking about lately is how sometimes like talking about 
money can be a little bit taboo unless we're talking about like tithing or like giving to the church. Mm -hmm. But other than that, just talking about how to invest or saving, like having a savings goal. Not saying that the church views that as bad, but I think you don't really hear a lot about like side hustles and like trying to make money Mm -hmm. and like all these things. So can you talk a little bit about what are your thoughts on money in general? How would you say your relationship is is with money. Yeah, I would say like for a lot of people, money is a really good tool to steward, but it's a really bad God. And I think that's kind of where a lot of people get tripped up. And certainly what the danger is for anyone who's, you know, either in a high paying job or they're earning extra money through, you know, a second job or whatever, that the danger is always to worship that money instead of use that money as a tool to, you know, steward your own household well, to love on others in your community well. So I think my disposition on money is that talking about it helps take that taboo nature away from it. Because if we like keep something to ourselves and we don't talk about it with anyone, well, then it becomes who's really like even encouraging me or keeping me in line on how I spend my money or how I look at my money, both uh, on both ends of the spectrum. If I'm not stewarding my money well at all, and I'm, you know, I have no money or I'm giving it away in the wrong way, sure, that's also bad. But there's another side of it where like it becomes an idol and people can hoard it. So I think that my disposition on money, of course, like you said, is, you know, my husband and I tithe, I tithe on, you know, both of our base incomes, and then we tithe on our my extra income as well. Um, And then a lot of it, obviously, I, I put aside stuff for taxes, and then we put into, you know, investment for the future. So part of that is things like, retirement accounts. And then part of that, you know, one day will become like a 529 plan for children's education. So there's a lot of things that we invest in. um, But then I would say beyond that, like anything left over to manage your household, you have to think about in terms of what's benefiting just me and what's benefiting my household as like an act of hospitality. So can I buy myself super fancy clothes? Maybe. Does that benefit anyone else besides like my own want to feel like exuberant or whatever I don't know so you know I kind of try to think about things through that lens like I love to spend money on having friends over love to cook for people love to have dinner parties love to be able to host people and I I think at least somewhat my bent is towards being able to do that for other people that's kind of what I've found with some extra money has come the freedom to serve people in that way a little bit more yeah I love that just the perspective of how am I using my money to serve other people or I think even be Christ to other people because something that I've just been kind of thinking more about is how money is a gift from God, just like everything else. Money is is a tool. And I believe that God expects us to steward that well in every sense of the word. So in like saving or in I even think of the parable where Jesus talks about the the king who gave his servants like each different talents and then all of them went and used it and multiplied it. And then that one servant was just hiding it in the ground, you know, Mm -hmm. and didn't do anything with it. And I'm like, well, I feel like with money, how are we using that well to serve others, to give to other people? And Mm -hmm. you talked about hospitality and like having people over. And then I think even in your side hustles of making the extra money and then being able to buy a house. For me, I look at that. I'm like, okay, God provided for you in that way through Mm -hmm through money, but you had to like go out and get it and like earn it and things like that. So you did reach your savings goal, right? For $10,000. I did. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What was your final, final amount? It was 10,900 something, I think like $72 and some change there. So I almost hit, all I know is I was like just short of 11,000 and people were like, you should have just done the extra $30 or $28 to hit it. It wasn't like an even number, but yeah, I was, I was about like 11 days ahead of my goal really in the end, which was just absurd. It's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's really awesome. So another thing I wanted to ask you about, so you said that you, you work for a church, Mm -hmm. so you had to actually go out and do side hustles to save up extra money. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about your thoughts on that because I, so I don't work for a church, but I'm just really involved in ministry Mm -hmm. and like small groups and volunteering and things like that. So what are your thoughts on knowing that, okay, with my job, I'm not really making enough to have put a down payment for a house and then Mm -hmm. also like cover other bills. What were your thoughts, thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say that, When you go into ministry, at least like when you're being trained to go into ministry, um, in my experience, one of the first things they'll tell you is that, you know, you're not in it for the money. And if you are, you're in the wrong profession. That's never going to be your goal. 
really like what ministry is, is partially um, being in the grace of the local church to support you. So one of the reasons tithing is so important is because in part, it supports church workers, right? So, you know, it kind of makes sense that I wouldn't, you know, make a ton of money from that, right? That would be a bad stewardship on my church's part of the tithe, right? Because if 100% of the tithe was going to my income, well, then we weren't helping people in the community, we weren't helping our own operations, stuff like that. So, you know, I understood going in to ministry that that was always going to be the case. I had a heart for missions growing up for a while. I thought I wanted to be like an overseas missionary. And, you know, so in my mind, I thought, you know, this is just what it is, is you're living in the grace of other people. You're living in the grace of the community that supports you, builds you. We had a lot of missionaries stay at our home growing up. I was involved with the Christian Missionary Alliance was kind of like my denomination growing up, which is largely based overseas, really. I mean, there's churches all across America, but there's also a lot of churches um, based overseas. And so we would host missionaries a lot. And really, they would come to our churches and basically say, like, thank you for letting us live in this area and do this work, right? So I was always kind of proximate to that. So it wasn't like a shock to me that that was going to be my reality. It was just kind of like, you know, I love doing this. I love ministry, love what I get to do. Very like people focused and writing focused, which I am like so blessed to be able to take part in. So, you know, all in all, I think they asked me this in the Bigger Picture pod or Bigger Picture Podcast, uh, Bigger Pockets podcast, you know, would I ever consider quitting my job because I make, you know, X, Y, Z, could I make more just doing side hustles? It's never been about money for me. And I think like if it came down to it, I would do what I did at the church for free. You know what I mean? So I think that like the, the call to ministry is always to some degree a call of poverty. I think of like, you know, the monastic lifestyle monks and I mean, nuns even take a vow of poverty. Now that's a literal translation. Sure. You know, I'm not saying that anyone who is a Christ follower has to take a vow of poverty. But I do think the idea behind that is that like, you're being supported by the grace of others. And you want to steward that well and not like be exuberant in what you're living off of from other people. I kind of want to get a little bit bit more into that because something I've just just heard a lot lately is things like church staff are underpaid Mm. or I think with me so I volunteer for refugee ministry I've been doing that for two years Mm -hmm. I'm not getting paid it's just Mm -hmm. something that I I love doing so I'm I would consider myself like a volunteer staff because like of how involved I am in the ministry Mm -hmm. but then other people ask me like oh are they paying you I'm like no and then it's kind of like well you're kind of giving a lot of time to that so Mm -hmm. You're talking, you're talking about just being supported by the grace of others. What do you think when that support financially is literally not a lot? Like it's not, it's enough, but then you're not able to live maybe a certain lifestyle that you mm-hmm. might want to mm-hmm. because of, of what you're doing. So what do you think about that? I think it's twofold because part of, you know, church workers being supported is kind of on the responsibility of you know, I'll say maybe like the lead pastor, the teaching pastor to encourage church members to tithe because, you know, to be frank, not everyone in the church is tithing. Tithing is definitely not as common as it was. So when you talk about like church workers aren't getting paid enough, like part of it is that like tithing is a practice we are so out of touch with that like, uh, you know, large portions of congregations, you know, they're involved, they're in small groups, they're, you know, doing whatever. But money is something that's taboo in America, very individualized. So you can say like, you know, I'm a Christian, I go to church, I read my Bible, I talk to people, but then it's like, well, do you want to give 10% to the church? Whoa, like you're asking me a really personal question and you, how dare you tell me what to do with my finances? And I get that, you know, I get that like hesitancy, but I think part of it is like a healthy view of finances that the church has um, as a whole, as a congregation, the local church has to be led through that. And then again, like, yeah, I think of how the apostles live. A lot of it seemed like there was no way they were going to get through that month or that trip or whatever. And somehow they always did, you know, so I do think there's something to say about God's providence that like, certainly some of it has to come down to, you know, getting an extra job or, you know, whatever. But if you're in church ministry to say like, I need to earn X amount of money, that is never guaranteed. And that's not what God's offering you. You know, what your reward is, is to participate in the divine call, right? To participate in the stewardship of God's creation, to love on his people. And, you know, I I don't know, I kind of take, um, I kind of take the side of like, you know, if you want to go into ministry 
and finances are the things that stress you out. That is something that like will always stress you out to some degree in ministry. So you're going to have to like, you know, like you said, like it's not the reason you're in ministry. So, you know, to some degree, it's something that you'll always have to rely on God for. And yeah, I found that he provides more than you can ever imagine. And it's not in the way you think. It's not like a check in the mail each month or whatever, but it's always in mysterious ways. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I think that he has, like I mentioned before, provided in a lot of ways, like so many opportunities that are around us to, you know, make more money or meet financial goals. So I think just you like going out and saying, I'm going to do this, 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 or whatever to make $10,000 is just a reminder of how like God is, God is so big and he may not necessarily like send a check in the mail every month, but it's like, okay, I think as believers, like it's good to just recognize how God is in everything and thinking about, okay, this is something I'm praying towards. I need money. Like I need to reach these finances. What are other ways that that I can do that and seeing how God can meet us, meet us in that. So can you talk a little bit about what you did to save up Mm $10,000 and then how doing that has brought you other opportunities to earn income and then what those sources of income are? Yeah, absolutely. So I started out with what I knew, which for me was, you know, the things I was doing through college, like I said, some of it was kind of like research studies. So one of those sites would be prolific. Researchers from different, you know, graduate schools or doctoral programs across the country run different studies, um, either for theses, either for, you know, ongoing researchers, research, you know, from professors and whatnot. But, you know, those pay anywhere from like 15 to $20 an hour, but they're real short. So most of them are like five minutes, 15 minutes, something like that. I was doing those. Um, In a similar vein, I was doing focus groups. So like consumer surveys, they'll show you a product like, hey, what do you think about it? You know, there's again, prolific and focus group, there's no like right or wrong answer, because it's just kind of opinions or like demographics, backgrounds, beliefs, stuff that you already have an opinion on, and can share. So I was doing those two things. I was doing data annotation, which is a little bit more niche, but it's kind of looking at correcting and editing and fact checking large language model responses. That is available to anyone um, in terms of like application, but they are a little bit more stringent on like what they're looking for in terms of workers. Things like cash back sites, you know, I was doing things like playing games to earn money, which is so funny, um, but like download a mobile game, play it and hit a certain level for a certain day. I was selling things from my closet. I was playing piano for different people um, for gigs. I mean, I was doing all kinds of stuff. So that's kind of where I started out and then just you know, in a crazy roundabout way, started kind of connecting with brands that were in my niche, which was absurd, and like got my first little brand deal. And I was like, Oh, my gosh, I can't believe this would happen to me. Like, this is like the craziest thing that's ever happened to me. And it really still is. And then through that kind of got into what I'll call like more passive influencer kind of revenue. So I got into the creativity program on TikTok which pays you a portion of the revenue of your views. So if people stay on TikTok longer, they're more likely to watch more ads, which is what TikTok wants because advertisers are paying for the biggest portion of their revenue, right? So if you create minute long videos or longer, TikTok's gonna pay you a portion of their ad sharing revenue per view. So if you get a thousand views, you get like mm, like a dollar seventy, right? which isn't a lot, but if you're getting a lot of views or you have one video that goes big and you're in that program, you know, it can add up to quite a bit. So I, so I got into that program kind of early on. I had hit the requirements. And then similarly, like things like an Amazon storefront where you can link things that you like or enjoy, people can click on that. And then again, in the same vein, referral links. So, you know, a brand either reaches out to you and says like, hey, like we love your content. Would you talk about this? We'll pay you for an ad, but then can you put this referral link in your bio? Anytime someone clicks that, you'll get $3. Anytime someone signs up, you get 10% of the commission or whatever. So that kind of in the back half really revved up my earnings to the point where I was really only doing like one or two hours of active work during the day. At the beginning of my challenge, I really was doing like three or four active hours. And I just kind of like hit this crazy point where like I really was earning over half of my income and what I'll call like really passive income. I wasn't doing too much active work for that, which was, it's just absurd. Like it's just crazy that, like people can earn, you know, money in that way. It's just a wild, it, it's just such an interesting insight when you're not in that and then you like get thrown really quickly into that to see like how people are earning. Because do you ever watch like 
someone online and you're like, I think their videos are really cool. I can't grasp like how they're actually making a living off of this, but I know they are. That's kind of like what it is, a large portion of it. So it's very bizarre, very interesting. Yeah, that's really, that's, I think that's pretty crazy. I want to talk about, so what are some other things that you've been involved in now because of you like putting that, that challenge up on, on TikTok that you've been able to do because you've gained a lot of, a lot of followers? Mm Mm-hmm. So now brand deals are more regular for me. I had to set up like a business email and I have, you know, brands kind of asking me for rates. At the time when I started, you know, I had a brand reach out and, you know, I I share, you know, specifics. I always try to be clear with my audience on how much I'm making because I think people deserve to see that. And I think, you know, if I'm being honest about everything else I'm making, I don't want to like gatekeep, you know, here's how much I made on an ad. I'm not telling you, but it was a lot, you know, so even though that's maybe uncomfortable in some regard when you first start out to kind of share something like that, I do share those numbers. So, you know, to be transparent, my first brand deal was $100. And to me, I was like, that's a whole day of my, you know, and that still is a crazy amount of money. That's a whole day of my, like, my my challenge. That's just absurd that anyone would want to give me $100 to talk about something. But then I had to kind of look at it. And the further I got into it, you realize that people aren't paying you just because you're you, they're paying for access to your audience, which makes sense. It's targeted advertising. So if a brand reaches out and they say, you know, hey, what are your rates? What they're asking is, what are you charging per 1,000 followers or whatever? We have a product that fits your niche. My audience is like 90% women ages 18 through 34, the large majority. And most of them are, you know, looking to earn extra money. Some of them are, you know, stay-at-home moms, single moms. Some of them are you know, working a job, working in grad school, all kinds of different, you know, backgrounds. But the thing that keeps them kind of like together, the common thread is that they want to earn extra money. So if it's a financial product, you can advertise a financial product to some sort of demographic, you can kind of pinpoint some stuff on like Google ads or TikTok targeted ads. But really what advertisers are paying for is like access to your specific audience. So now at the time of recording this, which is an absurd thing to say, I have like 120,000 followers, which again, is just like, doesn't even feel like a real number. Like I can't kind of grasp that. So advertisers are now asking like, what are your rates to be able to put this in front of your audience? So then you have to think like, is it a product I believe in? Is it something that like, I really want to put in front of my audience? I don't want to just do a cash grab, but also like, I do want to value how big that audience is, you know, whatever. So brand deals have been huge just crazy. And then really the TikTok's creativity program has has funded a lot. If you get like a big video, it really it pays well, which is crazy. It doesn't happen often. And you really can't guarantee that anything's going to go quote unquote viral or not. But when you're in that program, and you're getting paid per views, and you get a lot of views, you know, on a on a certain video, it really does help. So I think those are like the two biggest things that at the start, I had no means of obtaining. And just by sheer luck, I don't know, you know, just the right video at the right time or whatever, I gained enough followers for those two things to become a reality. So 120,000 followers on all platforms or on just on TikTok? Yeah, TikTok's really my only platform. Okay. Yeah, I've got an Instagram, but it's like just me private. You know, I like barely post. I think my last post was like my wedding. (laughs) I got married and then just like went off social media otherwise. So yeah, just on TikTok. Yeah. Okay. And then how much money and passive income would you say a month that you make? And do you see yourself continuing further into content creating Mm -hmm. and moving more into that? Yeah, so I share now on my TikTok weekly check-ins where I check all of that, what I'll call passive income from referral links from from the creativity program from my Amazon storefront. It's hard to give you a roundabout number because it depends on whether you've gotten a lot of views. It's it, it's very unstable. You're not going to, that's why I kind of bristle against the idea of doing something like that full time. But I'll tell you over Christmas break, because of a few videos that went viral, because of kind of the end of that challenge. And I, re- I did a recap video where I listed, here's what I thought of each, you know, kind of side hustle I tried. That was received well. And then I started a new challenge. So that was kind of like a surge of new followers, a surge of views, stuff like that. I ended up making like 4000 some dollars off the creativity program. And then, you know, another like 1000 or 2000 off of referral links, Amazon storefront, something like that. And then now that we're into the year, I would say anywhere from like, 600 to a thousand dollars a week on the creativity program referral links probably like 500 
maybe 400, something like that when it dies down. Amazon storefront, nothing right now because I haven't touched it since November. Yeah, I try to be, I, I try to share all of those numbers each Sunday, my followers, but again, it like fluctuates so much. So if you ask me that in three months, it could be I make $100 a month or, you know, it could be that I had another video go viral and I made more. There's no way to know. I don't think really. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. I yeah. think, I mean, that's a job. That can be someone's job, you know, the yeah. income that yeah. you're making. And you already have, you already have a full-time job. Yeah. So that is, that's really cool. So how would you say that you see God in this? Mm. I think there's no way that I, you know, I could look back in, what did I start this in? Like October, really? The end of September, early October. There's no way like I was planning for any of this. Clearly, I like had no real, I didn't really have any desire to like reach a wide audience besides like just to keep myself accountable. So everything happening very fast and the way it did kind of just felt, of course, like God ordained. And it kind of felt like a moment like where I was at a crossroads of like, I have to steward this well. And I have to be, you know, humble to give this to God first. Otherwise, this can consume me. So I think in a way, like it was almost I saw God because I saw like the danger of not stewarding this well. So like money like that to someone who, you know, is right out of college, works in ministry can be extremely enticing. I mean, I could have took all of that and, you know, bought a luxury handbag or whatever. You know what I mean? So, you know, there's some part of it where it, it kind of felt like I had to admit that like, of course, money is an idol. Of course, money is something that entices so many of us, partially because it seems like the fix to a lot of our problems. So I had to give that to God, had to be honest about like, do I want to share that I tithe? Do I want to be honest about that? Do I want to talk to people about my faith? Do I want to include that like each week I go to worship team rehearsal, I go to work at church, you know, stuff like that. There are things you can choose to share or you can choose to be like, "Mm, I don't want to share that part of my life. If I'm sharing my financial details with everyone, like don't I want to also share the most important part about my life? Because finances are a part of life, but they're not the point of life. So if I'm sharing about finances, but I know the point of life, I should also share that. So I think kind of like... Aligning myself daily with that has been, you know, a challenge and something that I've had to walk humbly with God in. And because I know that that's like a fault that I can become like consumed by either the appraisal of others or the love of money can become an idol for sure. I've had to spend more time with God and like make sure that my heart is right with God because if not, like that can derail so quickly, I feel like. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's like a not a scary place to be in because you know, obviously I I trust God and I'm trying to follow where he leads, but like without God, definitely it would be scary for sure. Yeah. Earlier when I was just talking about how God is in everything, I think what I just meant is that he can work through anything and he does work through, through anything. And I'm sure prayer was maybe a part of the process and thinking about saving up and buying a new house and things like that. So it's just so cool to see like where that is now and how you're um, just continuing on and content creating and getting all these these new opportunities. Yeah, I can share a little bit more about really the reason I stopped working at a restaurant in January 2023 is because it shut down. And I was like, wow, that was like a big source of income. We really wanted that to kind of be able to finish saving for a house. So there was a lot of prayer that went into how can I continue to hit my savings goals if I've lost the source of income for me and my family. A lot of prayer, a lot of life changed. My husband changed jobs. Um, And then talking about like God moving through everything, like the insane way I feel like I've been able to see kind of like a full circle moment is when people will comment like, hey, like because of you posting this, I've been able to find out about this online side hustle. I've been able to make $100 extra a week, which has provided like stability for me and my kid, like whatever. That is like something that like I could never control and I could never like have imagined and to be able to provide you know, encouragement and hope in that way is, is something that's really like, it's really surreal. Being able to have that platform is one of the reasons I feel like I have to take it so seriously, because to be able to help someone like that, to provide like either financial help, or like financial like encouragement. And then if I chose to withhold the other part of that, that like, I know the meaning of life would be, I think, like detrimental. So I think that's where there's like that fine line between like, God's given me that opportunity. But man, like, I have to participate in it. Otherwise, like, it's not the full picture of what could be. That's really cool. I really love that. And really love your story and really inspired by it. Random question. Do you invest in the stock market? 
I have a high yield savings account. So, you know, part of that is like, and you know, they'll invest that money, but I don't actively buy and sell stocks. No. So I've got like investment accounts um, where portfolios are kind of managed for me. Those, those are things like a Roth IRA, high yield savings account. Currently, I don't invest in the stock market. It's just not something I know a lot about enough. You know, there's nothing wrong with it or with not doing it, but I don't feel comfortable right now. I tell people, you know, I talk about like earning extra money, but in terms of financial advice, like I'm still just a girl. So I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, I, you know, so I don't invest in stocks, but you could. I just don't know enough about it to not like accidentally trade all of our money away. So I don't do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> just yeah. to be safe for me and my husband. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Another question. What does your husband think about just the whole thing blowing up yeah. with content creating? What are his thoughts? He's so supportive. He's so sweet. My husband is like my biggest encourager. He's just a very like, he's he's so like sweet and kind and just speaks highly of me and everybody. Like he's just the biggest supporter ever. He's so go with the flow. So like any change that happens in our life, like I'm usually the ones that's like fighting for control. Like, oh, I got to do this and I got to do this to prepare. And he's just like, dude, this is exciting. Like I'm thrilled. So he's been super excited and I, I put, he likes to he likes to stay like in the background of it. Like I'll, I'll put little clips of him, but he likes to stay mostly anonymous. And yeah, he just likes to support from the sidelines. He likes every single one of my videos and saves it to a little folder he has on TikTok called My Wife, where he just saves all of them. And I'm like, I, you know me, like you don't have to save those. Like I'm here in real <laughs> life. And he's like, and I'm just saving them to support you. So he's so sweet. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. So you've done a lot in the past in the past year or so. You are involved in the TikTok creation activity program you've saved up ten thousand dollars more than ten thousand dollars bought a house moved into a house and just doing other things to to earn extra income and very involved in your church and the worship team and you have a podcast I forgot to mention that right yeah yeah I've got a podcast on um the bible my co-host and I um the church that I work at uh, go through the bible verse by verse at the rate we're going, it'll take us like 25 years. So maybe we'll at least get through like Genesis and Exodus um, before something occurs. But yeah, it's called Story, Symbol, Spirit. It's just a podcast on how to make sense of scripture, both contextually, both in like terms of symbolism, in terms of the grander story, in terms of the spiritual realm, kind of all of that, which I've had a lot of fun with. So I really enjoy doing that. We, we post those every week on Monday. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. So you got a lot of things going on. What is your next goal? And then like, just to wrap us up overall, what would you say the big picture is when you look back on, on your journey and just when thinking about money, what's the big mm -hmm. picture? So my next goal right now, I've given myself kind of a more relaxed goal of just earning some extra income each day of 2024. And the reason I want to do that is to throw it at our mortgage. So I've got a 30 year mortgage like most people. And really when you start to look at your mortgage like interest rate, when you start to look at how much of that 30 year payment is interest and how much of it is the actual cost of the house, you, you almost can't look at it too close because you get sick to your stomach. So, you know, it, it's surprising. I have, there's a mortgage payoff calculator on calculator.net. I actually, I linked it in my bio on TikTok just because like, I think it's like a really helpful it's just like a really helpful tool. And it's bizarre to see how small extra payments a month can make like years difference in your mortgage. So what I'm trying to do is pay down a little bit extra um, on my mortgage each month. I've been documenting that because we just moved into our house and they start like the full month after the first month that you live there. So my mortgage company is going to be like, why are you doing this? Um, so that's my goal. And then in terms of the big picture, I think Part of it is that when it comes to money, there is an aspect of prayer. There's an aspect of communion with God that has to come first. But then there's also an aspect of participation. So, you know, sometimes we pray for things. I wish that my financial situation was different. Certainly, I paid, I prayed for that for, you know, many years, you know, working in ministry. But ultimately, like what I found is, you know, sometimes the answer to prayer is that God's equipped you either through your resources, mentally, educationally, God's equipped you through, you know, different resources that you have, maybe talents, maybe you're good at something that you're able to monetize on and teach. So understanding that not always, but sometimes there's a nature that that has to be like you moving towards a goal prayerfully with God and that God mm -hmm. doesn't always just like drop things into your lap. That's been hard, but good. I think it teaches discipline. It teaches, like you said, with the parable of talents, stewardship. 
to whom much is given, much is required. That all comes to play. That's God talking about like, if I'm giving you a lot, you got to do stuff with it. You can't just like, okay, I gave you a lot. You're living in luxury for the rest of your life. You're hanging out and just chilling for the rest of the life. There's work to be done in the garden. There's work to be done now. So I think the big picture is that wherever you are financially, you can steward whatever you have well. I've been reading this book called, it's called A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. It's by William Law, who was a Puritan in the 1600s. So he's intense. He's crazy. He's like, I have two outfits. And he's like really intense. But what he says is, you know, stewardship of money doesn't only come when you have a lot of money, right? People think, well, when I have a lot of money, I'll tithe. When I have a lot of money, I'll start giving to people. William Law challenges that. And he said in his book, I, I've been reading it really slowly, because it's just been blowing my mind. But he said, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase him here. You know, if you only have a few dollars, isn't it more important that you steward those really well? Because if you have a lot of money, you can be more haphazard with it because you've got enough to cover your expenses and to cover others. But if you only have a few dollars, that's only the more reason to be more shrewd and more meticulous with how you give, how you save, how you tithe, how you spend, which I thought was just fascinating because, you know, there was a time in college where I was like, well, I can't tithe because I'm just a, a college kid. So I think, you know, understanding that first, like whatever financial situation you're in, you have the responsibility to start stewarding that, learning how to steward that. And then while you pray for your situation to change or while you pray for understanding in your situation, you may find that like the answer is just a lot different and a lot more hand in hand than you realize, I think. I love that. I, I'm i just sitting here like, yeah, you're... I couldn't have said it better myself. I, I just really, really love that answer and just really, really want to encourage and challenge just everyone, whoever's listening, to just think about, I, I think the first step is, what gifts do I have? What talent has God given me? And then not only that, but what resources do I have? You know what I mean? What opportunities are out there of really just educating ourselves on what are ways that I can I can earn more money. And God works through that. Like there's not anything that's like, well, that's not really God because God would have done, someone would have knocked on my door and given me money or mm -hmm. someone from church would have brought me a meal. You know what I mean? I think that we can see like God in, in literally everything. But the first thing, I love how you talked about partnering with God. Like there's a, there's a, uh, responsibility on us to be an active participant in in God answering the prayers, you know, answering our prayers. And I think it is important to realize that it's just not always in the way that we think. Like I'm thinking of Ephesians 3.20, where it says, to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So a lot of times I'm like, well, if I've thought about it, it's like God is probably like, yeah, that's not even close. Like I'm going to do better. So that's just really really amazing and really encouraging to know that we do play a part in in our situation like i'm thinking of the phrase that says work like it depends on you but pray like it it depends on god so mm -hmm. that's that's really awesome is there anything else that you want to share or let the audience know or anything i really i really love this conversation i think that money is just something that's not really talked about a lot i think it's that a hard thing to know about. Um, like you were talking about Roth IRAs and high yield savings accounts. Some people are probably like, what are you talking about? I think it's just been in the past like year or so that I've thought of those things. So I think they're important to think more about mm -hmm. what is money? Like what are other aspects of it that I, that I don't know about or that I can learn about or educate myself about? And I just really hope that this conversation would help people do that. Yeah. The last thing I'll say is that, yeah, I don't want anyone with anything really in our Christian walk. We should never be afraid of what's around the corner. So for money, that looks like just understanding it, not being afraid of it. You know, you don't want to get into the cycle of like, I'm afraid to check my bank account because I don't know what's going on in there. You know, part of that is being honest with how do I spend? How do I, you know, save? What do I do? What do I need to cut back on? But, you know, part of it is like finding someone, whether that's in your church community, reaching out to someone who maybe does seem like they know a little bit more about money and just, you know, being like, hey, would you mind talking to me about something you would do in your 20s and your 30s? You know, if you were my age, whatever that age is, what would you do if you were in my position or my age? You'd be surprised at how much more open people are to those conversations than you think. But you're right. People don't talk about it. So I think being the one to talk about it with your friends, being the one to, you know, not 
gloat over it or talk excessively about it because there's a fine line. But being one to be like, hey, like I'm figuring this out, like I'm trying to find the best way to steward stuff and, and understanding if nothing more than just like gaining a financial wisdom to be able to understand how to best steward what you have now is, I think, a beautiful thing because you can serve more people the better you steward. Yeah. Yeah, that is amazing and so, so true. So thank you for just having this conversation with me. It was was so good and I definitely learned, learned a lot, learned a lot of new things. So I hope everyone did as well. I hope everyone just feels challenged and just feels more equipped to to handle money and learn about money and educate yourself about money. So thank you all for listening. Make sure to follow Big Picture Podcast on Instagram and we'll, I'll definitely have the everything that we mentioned the links and resources and all that in the show notes so make sure to watch out for that also follow jackie on tiktok and follow our podcast as well so i'm just really excited to hear what y'all think about this episode and see y'all next time